Well, I don't, I don't think it's a case of uh, splitting or staying together. I mean, I think this is a very uh, emotional idea that you have, to, you have to either break up or be together. Um, we're still very much um, friends. We're still very much uh, musicians with a common uh, cause. And uh, there's nothing to stop us making another record or touring again. Um, except that we, we achieved everything in seven years that we set out to do. And when we get back together again, it'll be with uh, a new outlook, hopefully a new way of presenting the band and a new way of uh, presenting our music. I, I just don't like the idea, and none of us do, of just repeating the old formula just for the sake of uh, money or because we can't think of anything else to do. We've got much too much imagination to uh, settle for that. So we're just taking the time and uh, enjoying ourselves in other pursuits, and who knows? On drums, I have uh, Omar Hakim, who normally works with Weather Report. He's a phenomenal drummer. He's frightening, actually. The bass player is from the Miles Davis band. He's called Daryl Jones. Um, Branford Marcellus, the sax player, and Kenny Kirkland, the keyboard player, are both um, normally associated with Winton Marcellus, who's probably the biggest name in jazz in America at the moment. So they're very illustrious guys, and uh, I was very pleased and honoured that they uh, wanted to play my material and do a world tour with me, and do an album, so... It's a beautiful old theatre with, with velvet seats and a proscenium arch, and it holds about 2,000 people. And we played there for seven nights. The reason is... Um, I'm, I think I'm fairly contrary, and I've, I've, I've done the massive stadiums. I've, I've played to more people than I can imagine. Yeah, I've seen you at a few, yeah. And uh, I wanted to go back to playing uh, small places, or small-ish places. I mean, 2,000 doesn't seem like uh, a lot to me. It might seem a lot to other people, but for me, it just, it just put me back a few years. And uh, I had to work very hard, and the Parisian audience is um, notoriously cool and chic and uh, reserved and yet every night we'd get them up on their feet and they'd be going so uh, and the reviews were fantastic so i feel very pleased about paris it was very positive for me well, i didn't just limit the uh the set to new material i did play old uh, material that uh, was rearranged for this band which is quite exciting so everyone got what they wanted really and the audience was split into two they were, they were the sort of pop fans and then they were sort of serious music fans, and, and both both groups of people were looking at the band and looking at each other. It's quite an interesting uh, clash. I'll try and give you a quick uh, resume of why the Dream of the Blue Turtles. At first, it sounds very frivolous, I admit, but it's linked to my um, interest and my. Um, subjection to Jungian analysis where um, you have your dreams analyzed by an expert and you're encouraged to uh, use your dreams creatively either to draw them or paint them or write about them or in my case what I do best is to uh, is to compose music that, that reflects the the mood or the atmosphere of a dream so my dream is this <laughs> I, uh, I have a a nice back garden at home. It's very small and it's, it's walled and covered in ivy and there's a beautiful lawn and a flower bed. And it's very ordered and disciplined and English, right? And I'm looking out of the window at this garden when suddenly out of a hole in the wall crawl these four enormous blue turtles and they're prehistoric and athletic and macho and sort of drunk on their own virility. They're huge creatures. And they start um, doing backflips and somersaults and in the process churn up my garden, completely destroy my beautiful English garden. Now, <laughs> in the dream, instead of being angry at this, I'm laughing. I'm really enjoying this spectacle. So I woke up in a cold sweat and started to write this dream down and try to work out what on earth it meant. And uh, my interpretation is this, that the four blue turtles are the guys in the band. And what they're doing 
is um, destroying my easy options, my my formularized way of making music, if you like. Um, and if, if you take the symbolism further, by churning up the ground, what you do in a, on a farm to, to, for next year's crop is you churn the ground up so that next year will be fertile. You turn, turn the land over. So really, it was a very positive dream, and the fact that I'm laughing and the fact that I'm enjoying this uh, apparently destructive thing it was a very confirming um, experience. So I called the album The Dream of the Blue Turtles, and uh, a piece of music uh, describes it rather better than I can with words. Well, um, I, I did two movies last year which are, are going to come out in August. One is called Plenty, which stars Meryl Streep, and the other is called The Bride, which stars Jennifer Beals, and I play Dr. Frankenstein in that one. So I, I've really put uh, movies on hold until next year, but in Paris, um, along with a, a director called Michael Apted, who... Um, is English and who's, who's, who was an Oscar nominee for the coal miner's daughter and has done lots of documentary work here in England. Uh, we shot a film about the beginning of this band, largely because rock films are usually about bands when they when they're finished or when they're at the top. And th I thought, like a love affair, this this would be uh, more exciting to be about a band at the beginning. And so we shot ten days of our life as a band in Paris rehearsals, uh, eating, sleeping, traveling, and eventually we shot the shows at the end of it. Um, part of it was also uh, the birth of my child, which <laughs> happened by accident. We thought it, was, uh, it might be valid in the film. So we shot everything that happened in those 10 days with six movie cameras. And uh, that's going to be out at the end of the year. I don't really uh, like hiding under a flag or a, a national uh, identity. That's not to say I'm unpatriotic. I love England, but I don't really feel as if I belong solely to England or, or that uh, I need to even, to even think like that. I do feel stateless, and I think it's, everyone should. <laughs> I spend most of my time at 35,000 feet <laughs> reading books. The full title is The Russians Love Their Children Too, and was inspired really by um, a thought, a very simple, almost trite thought, that uh, maybe Russians do love their children. I think we're conditioned in, in the West to uh, imagine that Russians are demographic, um, robotic morons. Uh, which makes us makes it easier to kill them. If, if we if we think the enemy aren't human, then it's much easier to to drop a bomb on them. And I think they're they're conditioned in the same way about us. If we want to uh, alleviate that tension, I think we ought to start thinking about Russians as real people. And the simplest way of doing it is is to think of them as biological beings, just like we are, with the need to procreate. <laughs> and. Uh, one of the things about having children is that uh, you can't help but love them. And so this, this is a very simple statement, a ridiculous statement to make in any other world but ours. So this, that's the Russians love their children too.